we can certainly do that too. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Geller, Director of MetalCon, and I'm delighted to welcome you to MetalCon Live today. I'm here with Kaylin Burke, Managing the Controls. And today's session is brought to you by the Metal Construction Association. We're bringing you Tom Seitz, Executive Director of the MCM Alliance, and a panel of experts on the topic of cladding, safety, in light of global fires. They will take a deep dive into why engineering evaluations should be an acceptable alternative to running an NFPA 285 wall assembly test. I'd like to just share with you that MCA membership provides many benefits for member companies, including exclusive access to technical reports, research, data, industry information, a network, and also a discount for exhibiting at MetalCon. There are many, many other benefits to membership as well. If you'd like to learn more about it, please contact Jeff Irwin. His contact information is at the slide that you should be seeing on your screen. Also, be sure to mark your calendars for our next MetalCon Live, which will take place on May 4th. The title is A View from the Roof with Heidi Ellsworth of Roofer's Coffee Shop and Ask a Roofer. Now, before I hand things over to Tom, just a quick reminder that MetalCon 2022 registration is now open. And for a limited time, you can save an additional $20 on top of early bird prices when you race to register before May 15th. The Super Show for Metal and Construction and Design will feature hundreds of exhibits, all new education, networking, and so much more. We hope you can join us in Indianapolis from October 12th through the 15th. And finally, if you need any technical help, reach out to MetalCon support in the chat box, and don't forget to complete the post-webinar survey to earn AIA LUs for today's session. And that's all I have. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Tom. Okay, let's pull this up here. Good, good. Thanks, Judy. You're and we're glad to be here for today's MetalCon Live presentation. And I wanna thank all of you that are on this webinar for attending. Our hope is that it's a very informative discussion. And as Judy said, I'm Tom Seitz, the Executive Director of the MCA Alliance. And I'm sure your first question is, what is the MCM Alliance? Well, we're part of the Metal Construction Association, MCA, and we're a group of leading manufacturers, fabricators, and suppliers of MCM materials and systems for the North American architectural marketplace. We're proactively working together to provide the construction industry with product performance testing, MCM-based research papers, and we're participating in all the IBC code compliance forums. Our ongoing mission is to help educate architects, consultants, code writers, building owners, and anybody who will listen on the advantages of using MCM. Which brings us to today's webinar. This subject is part of our ongoing series, Cladding Safety in Light of Global Fires. And our subject today, specific subject, is engineering evaluations potentially a great option? We're here to take a deep dive into why EEs, engineering evaluations, or EJs, engineering judgments, as sometimes they're called, are great alternatives. But to really get into the woods, into the deep woods, I've got some real experts who deal with this subject on a daily basis. We've got Dan Martin, a fire protection engineer from Jensen Hughes, Andy Williams, the technical director within the MCA, and the CEO of CEI Materials, Jeff Henry, a fabricator of MCM products. So now we get into the learning objectives because every AIA presentation has to have good, good objectives. And the first thing is we're gonna do is identify what an EE engineering evaluation is and why it's a critical design component. Two, we're going to Tom. review what the fire professional uses to develop an EE. Tom, yeah. your, screen, your screen is not being shown. All they can see is our lovely faces. Really? Yep. Which is good by me, but you might want to show some of the slides. They can't, they can't see this next slide. Uh, that was on the chat. No, the slides are not coming up. Wow. 
Judy? But you see the pictures here, right? I see. Um, the... I'm here to help. Um, so we are not seeing anything on your screen right now. Go ahead and click the share screen button that you clicked earlier today during our test call. Okay, hold on. Hold on a second here. Hold on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Share screen. Okay. Somebody got knocked off there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're seeing your email. So go ahead and open up the file you wanted us to view. There you go. You can go ahead and make that full screen if you'd like. Perfect. Got it. Yep. Now we're seeing it. All right. All right. So here we go. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll start back at the today's learning objectives. First thing is we're going to do is identify what an EE, an engineering evaluation is, and why it's a critical to the design component. Number two, we're going to review what the fine fire professional uses to develop an EE. Next, we'll take a deep dive into the layer by layer parts of the wall assembly. After that, we're going to go define the relationship between a successful MFP 285 and an EE. And last but not least, we're going to explore the role of an EE has during the design development and review process. But to put things into context, let's identify the codes we're going to be dealing with. The NBC, the National Building Code of Canada, and the US International Building Code. And the purpose of these codes is to establish the minimum requirements for life safety and property for fire and provide a level of safety to the firefighters and emergency first responders. Very, very important. Now, I'm just gonna take a little sidebar on this one because I wanna publicly acknowledge and thank Dan Martin and Andy Williams for their participation, years of participation in the code meetings that they have every other year or they vary in different places but they spend a lot of time, they spent two weeks, about three weeks ago, I guess they were in Rochester, New York, over 200 people were there. They spent a lot of time doing this work. There's a lot that goes into these codes. And I wanna just thank them and call out that, that these are the kinds of people that are, we're dealing with on a daily basis. So on that note, Andy, I'm gonna have you explain what we're talking about regarding the large scale fire testing. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, we have a tendency to focus here in the United States, we have a tendency to focus all of our discussion on NFPA 285, the large scale fire test. But I want to make sure that people understand that Canada also has their own large scale fire test in the ULC S-134. While we are, um, the measurements are different, the fuel source is different, the construction is a little bit different. But at the end of the day, what we're really interested in is we're really interested in how the flames progress vertically up the exterior wall or within the exterior wall. Now, these are listed in the International Building Code for the US and the National Building Code for Canada, but that's kind of not the end of the story because each province or each state, in fact, in a lot of cases, the major metropolitan areas have modified the requirements for their particular jurisdictions based upon uh, how many high rise buildings they have, how tightly their downtown areas are, are packed, uh, talking about access if there was a fire. So we really have to dig beyond just these basic tests, but we'll talk mostly about the NFPA 285 today. Slide. Okay, being the oldest guy in the group here, I guess I get to uh, talk about the history and in a real in a real nutshell, uh, basically we began full-scale testing back in the 1970s, as you can see by the timeline, and it has been modified. The testing procedures and the standards themselves have been modified several times between the 70s and 2019. 2019 is the current is currently the uh, latest NFPA 285 standard, and uh, that's the one that most of the designs that I'm dealing with. Uh, are involved, they use that particular version because that particular version introduced the joints, the vertical joint above the window and the horizontal joint uh, just above the window. So uh, those are the, the latest change, if you will. 
The reason that we've had these changes and the development of this test is shown in the bullet points, to increase consistency, to increase safety, to decrease the prep time. At one point in time, there were only two facilities that were able to run this test. And sometimes you're putting a product on the wall that takes two weeks to construct and 30 days to cure. So it really limits the number of times you can run this test. Currently, we were going through it the other day. Currently, there are five or six uh, labs that have it now, but scheduling is still uh, a concern. And finally, this particular test has been shown to give us a realistic level of difficulty. We have not found that a, a product, an assembly that has been tested to NFPA 285, we have not found that we have had any problems in the field relating field performance to the NFPA 285 test. We've not been surprised to date and hopefully we're not gonna be surprised. And I don't believe that we will. Slide. <clears throat> Again, talking about the tests themselves, the NFPA 285 determines the vertical flame spread up the wall, both within the cavity and on the exterior cladding. It also has a criteria in it for horizontal flame spread, although the vertical flame spread is really the, the true uh, metric that is uh, really the pass-fail criteria. We evaluate the flame spread across the wall, within the cavity, and from floor to floor. But the most important point of this particular slide is that the NFPA is a wall assembly test. Dan's going to get into talking about what makes an assembly. So that'll be important as we go forward. Here are some, uh, this particular drawing shows the, uh, the major elements. Uh, obviously, from the inside out, we've got the weather barrier. Uh, some type of insulation. In many cases, it's mineral wool, but there also is the opportunity to use different types and different levels of foam plastic for insulation material. Then we've got the uh, air cavity behind the, or above, right next to the mineral wool or the foam plastic insulation, we've got the air cavity to be covered up with the exterior cladding that is some type of an attachment system shown uh, to hold it in place. That's what's shown here. Slide, please. All right, this is a, uh, we at one of our presentations that we did, we had a video that we showed, but I wanted to cut it down from the three minutes down to just a couple. And uh, this particular photograph is the test sample before the uh, fire is ignited. If you see in the lower right-hand corner, you can see it's a little bit blurry, but there's a clock timer there. That's what that red, uh, series of numbers is. Slide. This test begins for the first five minutes with a gas fire being ignited in the burn room on the inside of the test facility. Next slide. After five minutes, we add the exterior window burner to the flames that are emanating from the room. This gives us a realistic uh, simulation of flashover within the building and the attacking on the exterior cladding. Next slide, please. Okay, now you'll notice down in the uh, lower right-hand corner, that's actually says about 18 minutes. This is about 18 minutes into a 30 minute test. The burn pattern that upside down U or upside down V is a very common pattern that we see in these fires. And in this particular test, what we're seeing is uh, in the center part, the uh, paint has burned away and it has exposed the metal surface of the MCM panels. This is an MCM test. The uh, brown or black uh, framing is the paint changing color. And you also see if you look up to the second panel above the window, on the right hand side of the center joint, you'll see that there's some distortion in the panels also. When these panels and these wall systems are exposed to this type of a test, you get a lot of movement and a lot of uh, uh, different things happening to the panels other than just burning. Next slide, please. This uh, particular slide is at the end of the test. It's almost 30 minutes into the test, 29 minutes and some seconds. And you can see that in this particular test, the flames did not progress very far, basically because other than the window burner and the flames inside the room, there was nothing combustible to make the flames crawl up the wall, which is one of the pass-fail criteria. Next slide, please. And finally, this is after the test, uh, after the burners are put out. This particular test, the uh, panels go out almost immediately. 
And you can see just above the window that the entire panel system was burned through. There you see a hole that goes all the way back to the studs. But you can get an idea of the damage and the damage pattern that we see in the NFPA 285 test. Slide. Hey, Andy. Great. Andy, thanks. Hey, Jeff, you know, there's a lot of many confusing items in this process, but one of the major ones is when to apply the NFP 285. And can you give us some insight into how that's done? Yeah, Tom, I can. So um, here's a decision tree that uh, was created to help determine when to apply NFPA 285 when combustible claddings are present. Uh, the first parameter that we look at is building construction type. If it's a non-combustible construction, that's types one, two, three, or four, then NFPA 285 must be considered. If it's construction type five, um, combustible materials are allowed and NFPA 285 is not a factor. The next thing I look at uh, is what's going on behind the cladding system. Um, is there insulation uh, outbound of the sheathing? And if so, uh, what type of insulation is it? Um, if it's a foam plastic insulation, then, then you need to, to certainly uh, consider and test to NFPA 285. Uh, if there's no insulation outbound of the sheathing, or if the insulation isn't flammable, then like a mineral wool insulation, then we look at building height. Um, anything over 40 feet, the, it, need, this, it needs to be tested to NFPA 285. So uh, again, real simply put, over 40 feet, uh, it's, NFPA 285 is a requirement. Great. Jeff, the other thing is your experience as a fabricator with the engineering evaluations. I mean, you're, you're, you're right there you know, where the rubber meets the road with all these decisions that are happening and whatnot. Can you tell us what your experiences have been with it? Yeah, uh, you know, we participated in a lot of NFPA 285 tests, um, but we frequently leverage engineering evaluations. Uh, in cases where the local code, of code official or the architect request a project specific test, we typically first try to encourage them to look at uh, the, uh, an engineering evaluation as um, in lieu of, uh, of an NFPA 285 test. And it's usually, and that's typically driven by the project schedule and the budget. Uh, in today's world of construction, those are two uh, areas that we are constantly battling against: very tight schedules, very tight budgets. Um, so, so the EE route is certainly a um, a, a cheaper and quicker option. Um, we've got a, a high level of confidence in engineering evaluations, being that it's evaluated by a third part, excuse me, third party fire protection engineer, and it leverages past an FPA 285 test. Um, when a test is must be done, it's important, it's critical really to, to get experts involved early, get the fabricator, get the engineer involved early and begin the process of conducting an NFPA 285 test. Um, again, because as Andy mentioned early, we've got uh, you know, a handful of labs. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing for these tests um, and they are significant investments. And if you start to pursue that path late in the game, you're going to be way behind schedule uh, to begin your project and nobody likes to kick things off that way. Um, so that's usually why we, we, we first look at an engineering evaluation. Uh, a good example of this, a real life example of the benefit of an engineering evaluation, we recently uh, experienced on a project uh, that we were working on in Phoenix um, where metal plate panels were specified, uh, but the client wanted to pursue MCM. Uh, the local code official requested a project specific NFPA 285 test, uh, which again would have taken months to complete and add significant cost to an already tight budget. Um, in conjunction with the third party fire engineer that we are working with and the local code official, 
Um, we worked together to, uh, it, and the designer, and we worked to together to develop a project specific engineering evaluation that moved the project forward, uh, allowed us to maintain the, the, um, the, the schedule. And at the end of the day, it saved us roughly 60 to 80% of the cost of of what it would have taken to, to perform a physical test. So again, I've got lots of examples of where that's been the case. Um, it's really just looking at the um, looking at the situation with the team involved and really explaining to them exactly what um, an engineering evaluation is and why it's a viable option, which I know Dan's gonna spend some time unpacking that for us. Hey, thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks for uh, sharing your experiences because uh, we know you've got quite a few of them. So um, now the uh, the next one is using the use of the engineering evaluation, and Dan Martin's going to bring us up to speed on all his valuable knowledge. Dan, it's all yours. Thanks, Tom. Um, so what are engineering evaluations or engineering judgments? How do we use them? How do they come into play? Um, we're going to get into that, and then we're also going to get into um, how I, when I'm developing an engineering evaluation or engineering judgment for a wall assembly, kind of the steps I'm looking at and how we go forward. So as, as we've been discussing, the code tells us that th when we have combustibles in the exterior wall, and we hit these trigger points, NFPA 285 compliance is required. Well, through the code, you can develop engineering evaluations as a viable pathway to show that NFPA 285 compliance. And a lot of people are like, well, that's not in the code. That's not in the code. It, it, it is in the code. Um, if you look at the IBC section 10411, that is your alternative methods and materials section uh, that you can work with the code official or the AHJ and provide testing reports and testing data to show that you're meeting the intent of the code. So these engineering evaluations provide a good bridge between a tested assembly and what you're trying to design at the end of the day. Um, it can take and look at different construction configurations. It can look at different materials. Um, something that I've seen in the past that we've done as well is we've had to look at existing buildings, trying to evaluate, okay, this is what I have today. I need to reskin my building or I need to increase the R value of my installation. So how, and if I choose this, this, or this, how can that maintain compliance with the existing building code, which goes back to IBC or whatever your local code is to show 285 compliance. Um, the key here is that these engineering evaluations need to be based on data. They need to be based on um, successfully tested NFPA 285 assemblies. And they're all developed on a case-by-case -case basis. Not every building is going to be the same. Not every specific local code um, jurisdiction is the same. So each building in each wall, I could have one building with four different wall design configurations. They all need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, something important to remember here at the very beginning, an engineering evaluation may not solve or rectify every single design change. There are conditions where we don't have the experience, we don't have the test data, we don't have the knowledge base to show the technical justification for that modification, and you will still need to be required to perform a full-scale 285 test. So just keep that in mind. Engineering evaluations are a great tool, but they can't solve everything. You may have to go and run a test at the end of the day, and that's why it's important to get the fabricators and the manufacturers and everyone involved early on when you're designing and specking out your materials to make sure in the design phase you are developing and designing a code compliant 285 exterior wall. Next slide, please. So you're asking for an engineering evaluation or you've had one plop down on your desk and you're trying to figure out what does it mean? How does it work? What should I be looking for? So some of the things that you should be looking for in these engineering evaluations is, okay, who did it? Who completed the analysis? Uh, you need to be looking to see if it was from a, a technical organization. Um, some people, some will be like, um, look at ICCES. Um, for, they do code evaluation reports. IATMO does code evaluation reports. Uh, you have Intertech and UL. They have um, exterior wall design listings now 
for 285 compliant assemblies. There are uh, various fire consultants and fire engineers, design professionals that have been working with manufacturers and fabricators and and designers and architects and helping develop testing. So all these people that are involved in actual testing and evaluating these things. So making sure that that person that is developing or assigning these things has experience doing that. Um, whenever I'm developing an engineering evaluation, I'm always going to go through the assembly piece by piece. I'm clearly describing what, what is the proposed wall. I'm clearly describing what the successful tested assembly utilized. And then I'm going to go into the modifications of what is different between the two and making sure I'm providing technical justification on why those are okay. Now, those are more on the the, the specific, I'm going to get into two different types of engineering evaluations, um, but those are some of the things you're looking for. And as I said, it should be based on a successful 285 assembly. So it, like I said, it comes back to the testing, the testing experience, the technical rationale, fire performance of the materials and our knowledge of those writing these um, to put these together. Next slide, please. So there's two main types of engineering evaluations you might see out there. Um, you're gonna have a, ge a generic one, a generic extension of data. Um, these are going to be build -a walls If anyone's seen that, it's a table that includes several combinations of materials. Um, it's reliant on several tested assemblies together to form this analysis. You could have these from engineering firms. You could see these from UL or Intertech or ICCES or IATMO or whatever. They have these tables of all these combined things. So they've taken a large pool of tests and put together the available list of combinations. Um, the next type is a specific engineering evaluation, and this is a true case by case, building by building, wall by wall evaluation. So a lot of times I get these requests from architects, sometimes from fabricators, the general contractor or the or the code official is looking for that specific information. And several times that could come from a generic analysis. So the generic extension of data, you've got this available list, but the code official wants a PE stamped engineering letter that says, hey, these combinations of materials are acceptable. Here's the technical justification as to why, but it gets into the very nitty gritty on those walls. Next slide, please. So a little bit more detailed on the generic extension of results. As I said, it, it, it's a build -a wall. It gets into a table or a means of documenting every single layer of that assembly. And it provides the technical justifications in the report um, along with what those viable combinations of are. So we're gonna look at the base wall construction. It's gonna outline all the various types you can use. It's gonna look at the insulation. It's going to look at the water resistive barrier. It's going to look at the attachment system in some cases. It's gonna look at the possible veneers. And this is based on tested data, as I said, 285, um, compliant assemblies and are the consultants judgment and based on their testing experience. Um, some of them don't specifically provide the explicit rationale or technical justifications for why these were included. You might see that in the UL or Intertech or ICCES or those, those code evaluation reports. The engineering technical justifications were provided to those third party evaluation services and to document those are being acceptable. And the key thing is these are living documents. Um, the amount of materials that are allowed may change. You also might lose out on some things as things change. People are changing how their formulations of their materials or they're actually running more tests so we can include more stuff. So it, everything's changing. These are living documents as we go and add more data to the system. This is science. As we get more data, opinions will change. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of what I call and we call in the industry a build-a-wall generic engineering evaluation. This is a snippet 
out of one of those reports. So it's the technical justifications have already been provided. They're elsewhere in the report. But this is what it looks like. And this is something that you would see in um, UL design listing, intertech listing, ICCES evaluation report, IATMO, all those things. It's going to break it down into each of the major components. Baseball construction. What can I use as my baseball? Steel stud and jib, concrete precast, or I'm using a CMU wall. Uh, what kind of insulation can I use within the stud cavity if I'm using a stud wall? It's all based on tested assemblies. If, uh, into the exterior sheathing, the various water resistant barriers you could use with this combination of materials. Then we're going to look at the exterior insulation component to it. What's allowed, what's not, are there special requirements depending on what is being used? And then we can get into the exterior veneer and uh, what are is acceptable. In this case, you're looking at brick, concrete, CMU, stone veneer, or terracotta. And these are more of the thermally heavy materials. So this one table could be a result of one, two, or three NFPA 285 tests, depending on, on the background information being used. Um, but then it's extrapolated out through testing experience and knowledge of fire performance of materials to give you your variable options. Next slide. So specific. So like I said, this is your case by case, building specific, wall specific engineering analysis. Um, a lot of times I've changed out one component. Let's say I've got this 285 wall that's been tested, but I wanna change out the water resistive barrier because the contractor can do this or the fabricator says, hey, I've got my attachment system. It was used in this tested assembly, but I wanna change a few things. We've got to look at it specifically there. Um, we're, we're, these specific evaluations look at each wall component individually, but they also look at it as a whole. But it's not just the components that we're looking at that we're changing out. We're also looking at how that changes the potential changes to the geometry the air cavity space between the veneer and the exterior insulation, uh, the shape of the panels. Um, we're looking at the fastener system. We're looking at a variety of things that could change that geometry. The stud spacing in your, your base wall construction can impact compliance as well. We're looking at the whole thing from interior to exterior, interior jip all the way through the veneer. So these are critical, these specific engineering analysis reports to have that technical justification to show to the authority having jurisdiction or the AHJ that each individual component has technical rationale, but at the end of the, end of the day, all those individual changes need to ensure that the entire assembly will still maintain compliance. When you get into the specifics, generally the AHJ is looking for a professional engineering stamp on these documents. That's not always the case. It depends on the jurisdiction, but these specific ones, you will tend to see more PE stamp documentation uh, with this. Next slide, please. So going into what, what, are, what are these technical justifications? We need to be able to provide a rationale or a basis for including these changes. <clears throat> Why is it okay? Oh, well, my gut tells me it's okay. Well, it, that's not always gonna work. Uh, we need to make sure we have substantiating either test data or several years of experience of these materials on how they burn, showing that it's okay to make these changes. Um, like I said, it depends on the HJ. This kind of comes down to the generic versus specific. It's included in most of the generic evaluations, but the specific ones really need to make sure that they have this technical change to make sure that it proves through testing and experience and data driven and supported by a successfully tested 285 that these ext extensions make sense and they work as a system as a whole and the individual components. Next slide, please. So what can we modify? What, what, what can change in an engineering evaluation from a tested assembly? Um, here's a list of things that we can look at. As I said, not everything can be written into an engineering evaluation, at the end of the day, you might have to run a test because we just don't have the data to support it. So we can look at the base wall assembly. 
the cavity, the stud cavity insulation material? Is it spray foam? Is it mineral wool? Is it empty? Or is it fiberglass? It, it, all, it all depends on what was tested. We can look at that exterior gypsum sheathing and the water resistive barrier. Some exterior sheathings nowadays have that built in water resistive barrier component. And then as we continue to work out through the, to the veneer, you look at the insulation. Was it tested with combustible or was it tested with non combustible insulation? How thick was it? What type was it? Those things can potentially change. And then the exterior wall coverings and the attachments themselves, we can vary that up based on what was tested. Next slide, please. So let's look at the base wall, for example. Uh, let's say we test a steel stud and gyp wall. Well, we, we know that from testing experience, we could swap it out for precast concrete or masonry for steel stud and gyp. We, we know that the thermal performance of those concrete and masonry walls are the same or better than a steel stud and gypsum wallboard assembly. Uh, going back to what can be put in the stud cavity. If we test it with none, we can add a non-combustible. But if we add a combustible spray foam, for example, we can swap that out for various non-combustible components or depending on how it was tested, the varying thickness of that combustible insulation in the stud cavity. So it all depends on what, like I said, what was tested and what your proposed is. Next slide, please. Oh, one other thing. A lot of people are nowadays are trying to get into the wood stud game with their exterior walls. Uh, 285, you can test with wood studs. There are ways of doing engineering evaluations to include wood studs based on a steel stud test. So. Just wanted to get that in there as well. Um, so let's get into water resistive barriers. Every water resistive barrier burns a little different. Every water resistive barrier comes in a different way. You have fluid applied, you have self-adhesive self uh, sticky water resistive barriers, and then you got the sheet goods that get stapled on. They all burn a little bit different and they can be changed out based on what was tested. We use uh, the cone calorimeter testing, which is a small scale four inch by four inch um, sample. And we measure the burning characteristics on them and we compare them to what the material was it was tested to see if it is going to increase or decrease the amount of combustible in the exterior wall. Next slide, please. So looking at the exterior wall coverings and attachment systems. The attachment systems can vary. You can have combustible attachment systems. The fabricators may have their own attachment system that they've, they've utilized and fabricated or their extrusions and they've been tested and they wanna use their system. They can use their system in engineering evaluations based on other tests showing that they're either non-combustible or they're combustible, but they're protected. You, when it comes to the shims and the small pieces and parts, like you see those little red shims there underneath the, the uh, support post, 285 in the building code does not really look at that. That is a small little accessory. We're looking for full coverage things. And some of these um, fiber reinforced plastic anchors or these other combustible um, attachment systems can run vertically the full length or laterally the full length. They're not necessarily just the small little pieces. So we have to look at those as well and how that works and how the attachment system works. Is it bolted through or is it a hidden fastener? Is it an open joint system versus a closed joint system? All that comes into play sometimes when we're looking at um, the exterior walls. So next slide, please. Okay, so outside of the base wall and the attachment system, we've got to insulate the building. Um, depending on what was tested, if you're using a foam plastic insulation, can I change the thickness of the foam? That can be evaluated in engineering evaluation. If I test four inches of a specific foam, can I use five? Well, the answer for that one's no, but can I decrease it to three or two and a half? Yeah, we can decrease the amount of combustible in the wall and, and um, still use that combustible insulation. Mineral wool insulation. If we test a mineral wool wall, I'm not gonna be able to give you a foam plastic insulation on the outside because we'd be testing a non-combustible mineral wool and putting up a combustible. We're adding BTUs to the wall that weren't there before. 
But if I had tested a foam plastic and I want to switch over to mineral, well, that's a different story. We can talk about that and, and possibly include that. So there's different ways we can look at things. Sometimes we can change the type of exterior insulation being used. It depends on what the veneer is and what testing data we have to support that and what combinations of materials. And I think the next one up is the wall covering itself. Um, as you saw in that build a wall, you had brick, stucco, stone, concrete, terracotta. Those are the thermally heavies in, in our eyes. Those are the ones that absorb a lot of heat. They're non-combustible. They can be incorporated based on a test that uses a combustible exterior veneer. So in this case, if we ran an MCM test with a combination of X insulation with X water resistive barrier, the, the build a wall can be utilized or a specific engineering evaluation say, hey, I've got this MCM test, but I'm gonna use an artificial stone instead. Well, we can make that, that move to there. Um, but we can't go the opposite way. If I run a brick test, it's a very heavily thermally thick material. It's going to deflect the flames. It's not going to warp. It's not going to buckle. Uh, I can't go in the opposite direction to combustible material. So once again, it comes down to what's been tested and what combinations of materials to see what we can do. Hey, Dan, I got a question regarding MCM. The, if you have different skins, in other words, some of the MCMs come up with copper or zinc or steel, you know, stainless steel or something like that. Mm -hmm. How does that impact it? So the skin itself can actually play a role in how you evaluate this. Um, the melting temperature of that steel or aluminum or zinc or copper can change how the fire performance of the assembly is. Um, in discussions with a lot of the MCM manufacturers over the years, they suggested that if you are specifically looking for, let's say, a zinc panel wall, you should investigate utilizing a zinc panel based 285 test. Um, obviously steel skins are, are non-combustible. They're gonna protect that interior core a lot better, but as you go down to aluminum and zinc with the lower melting points, that'll change how things work. Sometimes we can work it in if we have test data to support that this, this panel with steel has been tested and this panel with aluminum has been tested in the same configuration. We have those justifications to make those combinations together. So it, it, it plays into what testing is out there. The manufacturers have tested the various skins. So they have the data that you need. The fabricators should have that data. Either they can go to the manufacturers or they've done their own testing to develop their their databases over the years. So changing the skin can have an impact on the compliance of the assembly. Thanks. And then lastly, as I said, we have to address the assembly as a whole. I can't just look at an individual component, A, B, and C. I've changed three things in the wall. They all look good. That's awesome. All three individual things look good. But if I go back, to looking at the assembly as a whole. And I noticed that those small changes make a big difference in how the fire performance of the entire assembly is going to be, then I cannot accept that change. So you got to make sure you're going, the, the evaluations go back to the entire assembly and ensure all those small changes don't impact the assembly as a whole. So what's not addressed? See, some of the things that that we don't address in, in our engineering evaluation reports. Um, if it's just the 285 compliance thing, we're only looking at flame spread. We're not looking at the fire resistance rating of the assembly. That's all through ASTM E119. We can incorporate that into the letter if that is of concern. Uh, but traditionally, we're not looking at the fire resistance here. We're only looking at flame spread. We're not looking at the durability of the materials. We're not looking at the weatherability. That's outsider expertise. And we're not looking at the structural components of it, of how it's all going to be up. I'm, I'm just a fire guy. I'm not a structural guy. So just be aware that depending on what type of information you're looking for at the end of the day, it may not be included if you're just looking for 285 evaluation because it's only flame spread. And I, so the key question that the engineering evaluation must, must answer, and I've repeatedly said this over and over again, will the change or substitution that my proposed wall assembly has, can I support that with a successful 285 test? And will I be able to look at the assembly as a whole 
to show compliance with 285 and the intent of the code. Are these changes supported? Will it impact the overall performance of the entire assembly? And do I have the technical justifications in that evaluation? Okay, Dan, thanks very much. And I think we've come to the part of the presentation where now we have to go back to the learning objectives and basically summarize them, which comes into my, my basket. And the engineering evaluation is a critical design element supporting the desired changes in the NFP 285 tested wall assembly by showing the impact of those desired changes on that test. So it, it works together in there. And the elements that Dan has gone over is, you know, we need a successful 285 test report. We've got other fire and physical testing that actually come together to develop that EE. And the engineering judgment and past experiences and testing and real world performance also impact the development of this engineering evaluation. And not only is each layer important in this process, but the orientation, the interaction between the layers is critical to the overall performance of that wall assembly. All of these things are interrelated. The basic foundation for an engineering evaluation is a successfully tested wall assembly, bottom line. Dan just mentioned that. You gotta have that to start with. And an engineering evaluation is not a simple analysis, nor should it be. Lots of time and research is required for a complete evaluation. Please remember this evaluation must be acceptable to the AHJ. He's the bottom line of this thing, he or she is. They have to understand what's going on here. So as we all know, time in construction is always a challenge. So trying to get ahead of this early on for an engineering evaluation is key to everything. If you have to do it after the fact, it becomes a real challenge as Jeff has expressed his experience with. So that's kind of the summation of these learning objectives. And, and I definitely uh, you know, want to thank all of you for attending today. And I think, I hope we might have some questions, Andy or Kaylin, whatever. Uh, Andy, what do you have there? Anything? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions actually. Um, the first question is for Jeff. And that was, uh, Jeff, when you were talking about your flow chart for uh, determining whether or not you need an NFPA 285, are you saying that for types one through four construction, if the cladding is non-combustible, that you don't need an NFPA 285? Well, not necessarily, um, because you also have to look at the weather resistant barrier and the insulation. Uh, if the insulation is combustible, then you need to um, pursue an NFPA 285. And then you got to look at the weather resistant barrier. If, it, if, if the fuel limits define, if it exceeds the fuel limits defined in uh, chapter 14 in IBC, then you need to also look at uh, NFPA 285 testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan, here's a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that when we're evaluating, when you are evaluating the weather resistant barrier, you can use the cone calorimeter to give you information about how that weather resistant barrier performs. How come we can't use the cone calorimeter for the insulation and the panel and just not even have to run a 285 test? So the <laughs> Uh, excellent question. Not all small scale tests translate well to the full scale evaluation or full scale test. We know with foam plastic insulation specifically, small scale tests don't give us the true understanding of how they burn when exposed to larger flames and larger heat sources. Um, with the MCM panels, things and, and other exterior veneers, things start to get tricky because of how flames get deflect, deflected or they burn through the, the protective layer of the aluminum or the zinc or, or whatnot. Um, but the cone calorimeter does not have an open flame source to it. It's just a, a cone shaped heater that gives you a radiant heat flux onto the material. And you have a spark plug igniter in there that, that ignites all those combustible gases. Um, 
So it doesn't give you a true understanding of flame spread. It doesn't give you understanding of the burning characteristics in a vertical orientation or even horizontal orientation. It just gives us the burning characteristics in terms of data, the heat release rate, the heat of combustion, um, the peak heat release, the time to ignition, all things that play a role in evaluating exterior walls, but because the, the water is just a barrier, although it is an important component, it is full wall coverage. The burning behaves very similar when you're looking at it under a cone versus up on a wall. So we're looking more at the actual amount of burning um, when it comes to the foams, we know we need full scale no matter what. And then how the geometry comes into play with the exterior veneers, because usually the water resistant barriers are, are covered, they're sandwiched, they're hidden in, in the assembly somewhere. Um, so not all small scale tests work for all materials. I think that answers that question. It, it does, thank you. Uh, another question with regard to uh, the NFPA 285. We talk a lot in the MCM industry about NFPA 285 because that is that full scale test that we uh, tried to determine what's gonna happen in a real world fire. Now we know that there is a screening test that has been developed out there for the purposes of research. It's a bit smaller, it's got less instrumentation, but it gives you a pretty good idea of how the products perform. Are you aware of any substitute test, standalone in and of itself, that I could say, well, I didn't do the NFPA 285 test, but I did this one and it should be adequate. To my knowledge, no. It's it's run, it's 285 or bust. Um, I don't, there, there are other test standards or throughout the world, <laughs> like the CAN ULCS 134, the Germans have one, the Swedish have one, the British have one, the Elster. Everyone's got their own individual test, but when it comes down to meeting the code compliance, it, it's 285. Now, you said that the small screening insert test, which is based on NFPA 285, can be used as supplemental data in an analysis or an R&D project. But at the end of the day, it has to be proven through a full-scale test in order to be compliant with the, the IBC. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, got, I have two more questions here, and that's, uh, Again, we have a tendency as the MCM Alliance, we have a tendency to talk about MCM products all the time. Um, is this NFPA, the engineering evaluations or equivalencies, are, are they limited to MCM or is there a broader scale that we can apply this whole logic of an EE to? Um, engineering evaluations are not just limited to NFPA 285. Um, you find these across the board from and I, I'm, I'm a fire protection engineer, so I could go off on tangents and not and talk about things I don't know about, but structural engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, all that stuff. They're using engineering evaluations all the time. But things that I also use engineering evaluations for are for evaluating and coming up with um, fire stop systems for penetrations going through rated walls. Um, I'd write engineering evaluations on structural steel protection with combinations of spray fireproofing and intumescent paint. Um, we're writing engineering evaluation reports for egress modeling. We're gonna do a performance-based design and say, okay, if I have a fire this big, I can limit the number of exits I need because I've done fire modeling and I've done evacuation modeling and written this engineering evaluation for that. So engineering evaluations aren't just limited to 285. There's several ways that these are being used across the building environment to ensure that we're meeting the intent of the code when the prescriptive parameters, we can't meet them. And I'd like Andy. to add to that, Andy, we've used engineering evaluations for other cladding materials other than MCM. So we've used it for HPL, high pressure laminate, um, plate. So, uh, you know, it's really specific to the NFPA 285, but we're looking at all components that might make up a wall assembly test, right, Dan? Yeah, you're correct. I mean, yeah. I've done engineering evaluations on EF systems, uh, just changes in the foam plastic insulation. Um, you could get into the IMPs, the insulated metal panels, MCM, HPLs, um, some of these new glue lamb honeycomb um, type materials that have that combustible adhesive in there need to be tested at NFPA 285. Um, so there, there's a variety of things that uh, can be addressed in an engineering evaluation and not just MCM. 
Okay. Now here's one question from me and, and I get hit on this one on a regular basis, Dan. So here it comes. It's not too difficult. I often get uh, phone calls from someone saying, I have an NFPA 285 tested assembly test, a successful one. How does that uh, get me out? How does that get me out of, uh, I have to keep separation from the lot line? What, what's, why can't I use the NFPA 285 to justify lot line proximity? And what do I use instead of 285 if 285 is not the answer? So lot lines, fire separation distances. Okay, so as a reminder, NFPA 285 is that vertical and lateral flame spread test. It's intended to simulate a fully flashed over room compartment fire in the floor below, breaching out the window and up the side of the building. Now, when you get into fire separation distance, now we're getting into, okay, what is that critical heat flux for auto ignition of those materials? That's a completely different test. I believe that's the NFPA 268 test, which is a radiant panel test with a spark igniter that gives you that offset distance. And that is addressed in chapter seven of, um, I believe chapter seven and parts of 14 of the IBC talking about fire separation distance, completely different test. We're evaluating something completely different than with 285. So it's so an extra step. So the bottom line is the 285 test is about my wall assembly, not how a fire on my wall assembly impacts my next door neighbor. Correct. Thank you. That's all I've got for questions. Oh, wait a minute. I've just gotten something in the chat room. Let me look. Oh, nope, that's it. That's all the questions I've got. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, if there are any future, any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to MetalCon and we'll make sure that that information gets sent to the appropriate person on this panel. Uh, or you can always reach out to the NCA. The NCA is a fantastic resource for you, especially if you're a member. So be sure to consider that if you are someone in the metal construction industry. Again, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. We really appreciate each and every one of you for joining us for this full hour session and for creating this fantastic content. I also want to say a very special thank you to all of our attendees today. Thank you everybody for being here. And again, to receive your credit, it will be um, an AIA HSW this week. So you're gonna get that one hour AIA HSW if you are an AIA member. So be sure to fill out the quick little questionnaire we have immediately following this to make sure that we receive your AIA information to process it. Thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at a future MetalCon Live. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Kaylin. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. I did get uh, our, uh, are we still, uh, yeah, we're still here. Um, I did get one additional question from a Jean Awkar, A-W-K-A-R. If I could get her email address or his email address, I'll respond to this one uh, specifically. And I'll read it to you, quote, just so you know what the question is. Do we 